found that verse in Genesis 8. And this is after such catastrophe of the Lord's judgment. And the Lord says to Noah, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And it's, um, I've been, I, um, I do not listen to audio books as I travel, and I made a point recently of digging out an audio book that I knew existed in paper, and it was called, My House Shall Be a House of Prayer, and it's by a man called Lance Lambert that you may know of, you may have heard his name. Um, he's now with the Lord now, but I listened to this book, and it's quite a long one, and there's a, it's all about, obviously, the Lord's house, his church, learning to pray, and it's a bit of a school of prayer, but there's this theme that runs through it, and it's just this, he says, in spiritual things and in the battle we're in, to continue to proclaim that the Lord is on the throne. And he seemed to suggest in this book that that was the key to a lot of spiritual battles. It's just reminding ourselves that the Lord is on the throne. And um, it's good to praise the Lord and open our mouths, isn't it? And I just I want to encourage you as a church to continue to open our mouths and audibly thank the Lord, even if it's to say the Lord is on the throne, because we are in a battle, aren't we? And you may have noticed all those years ago you said something that offended somebody and they've never forgotten it. Because when you open your mouth and you say, you've got quite a big nose, haven't you? And they never forget about it, do they? It's the same with praise. That when you say something, it comes true. Well, it doesn't come true. It is true, isn't it? And the enemy can't refute it, can he? Oh no, they've said it. They've said the Lord is on the throne. And he shudders, doesn't he? So it's important that these things that are true and in our heart are spoken out in the days in which we live. The Lord is on the throne. That's true, isn't it? Hallelujah. Well, let's um, deal with some other truth, shall we? What about this quiz on the table? I know you like a bit of a quiz. Don't know anything? As I wrote this, I thought, gosh, if only my kids knew what was in half of this stuff. I think you do know these things, and it'd be interesting to go through them. Who reckons they know what the first one is? The ki- Not salt and pepper. Vianetta? Not Vianetta, nope. They're thin and they're square and they come in a box. After eight. After eight. Yeah, well, the trick is in the... The trick, obviously, in there is in the vegetable fat, isn't it? Everyone knew there's vegetable fat, loads of it, in after eights. What about the one that has dates in it? Who knows what products you get from Tesco's that has, that's one of its main ingredients is dates. Dates and vinegar. Sorry? Not oats? Not chutney? Not tomato paste? HP sauce. Do you know, yeah, yeah. Do you know that HP sauce is mostly dates? Yep. Who likes HP sauce now? Put some date sauce on my chips. Kids, it's mostly dates. What about this one with the secret ingredients? Coke. Yeah, they won't tell you what's in Coke. It just says flavors. They're, bit, they're big on their secret ingredients, and they've got their... their, their and, there's, and caffeine as well. Um, it's mostly caffeine, sugar, and secret ingredients, and they put some water in there to keep it healthy. What about the next one? What about rice, coconut oil, bamboo fiber? This is a hard one. No, you won't get this one. It's vegan cheese. Yeah, vegan cheese, mostly rice and bamboo. There we are. That's why pandas are going vegan. What about this one? What about potato starch and banana powder? You know this one, not milkshake, nope. That would be seaweed, wouldn't it? Potato starch and banana powder. Not custard. Angel Delight. Angel Delight. It's mostly potato. It's actually mashed potato. Yeah. Mashed potato and sugar. And they've stuck some banana powder in it just to keep us happy. Um, Blast in the past. What about this one then? What about the same ingredients as Coke? Water, sugar, secret ingredients, and caffeine. Not Pepsi. Dr. Pepper. Another secret. They won't tell us what's in it. And I bet there was never a doctor involved either. You won't like this one, but you will know it. Mostly pork, gelatin, and sugar. No more, no marshmallows. Jelly, yeah, jelly, yeah. Boil up some pig bones, stick some colour in it. Yeah, kids, it's mostly pig bones, jelly. 
Um, my kids will know this one. Tomato, sugar, vinegar, vinegar and spice. Ketchup. Ketchup, yeah. Hasn't he got spiders, I think? Then they say it's got spiders and flies. They just kind of put it all in and mash it together. But that's not the ingredients, because they wouldn't be vegetarian, would it? Um, okay, what about the same ingredients as jelly, but with beef gelatin? Not fruit jelly? Nope. And it's got beetroot as well, yep. Marshmallows, yeah, marsh pink marshmallows. Beetroot juice um, and beef bones, <laughs> yep. What about maize, starch, paprika extract, whey powder, sugar? Not chipsticks. Custard. That's custard. That's instant custard. What is handy is you can go home tonight and make these, can't you? Now you have most of the ingredients. Get a pig. Six of banana, a banana powder in it. Okay, what about this one? Whole grain wheat. Barley extract, salt, and riboflavin. Not bread. Not, not Ovaltine. Weetabix. That's Weetabix. It's probably the healthiest, healthiest, healthier thing on here, isn't it? Um, malt, vinegar, anchovies, and molasses. Not fish paste. Not HP sauce. Had that ready? Worcester sauce. Yeah, Worcester sauce. It's got anchovies in it. Little fish. Yep. And then the last one, um, rice, sugar, malt extract, and our, our old favorite, riboflavin. Any guesses? Sorry? Not Vegemite. Oh, I should have done that. I should have done Marmite, shouldn't I? Yeah. Rice Krispies. Yeah, Rice Krispies. Yeah, stick some, um, stick some um, cocoa solids. You'll have Rice uh, Cocoa Pops. Yep. Um, I don't know if you know what's in your stuff, but now you do. Sorry? Okay, so it's um, rice, sugar, malt extract, and riboflavin. Get you your own Cocoa Pops, Ruby. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me there. I haven't a clue. It's just on the list. It is, actually. And, yeah, these things have got an awful lot of um, vitamins and stuff in. So that's um, some insights into what's on this table over here. And now we're going to look at the Word of God. So if you have your Bible with you... Um, I was asked to speak about harvest, and um, and it's interesting, isn't it? Up and down the nation um, today, there are many people talking about harvest, probably, and um, it's interesting. I wonder what direction they're going in. It's interesting. The first song we sung. Um, the hymn writer starts by talking about the harvest in our fields. And then if you notice, he then goes on to talking about the harvest in Revelation. The Revelation has a harvest theme, doesn't it? Um, one of the angels is told to take his sickle and to go and... He says, the harvest is ready. And the Lord says, there's a harvest. It's the harvest of souls. And it's, a, it's an end of the Bible theme. It's also a Jesus theme. And if you look in Luke 10... And you may not be surprised to hear me reading this verse. It says in verse 2, And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And it may not surprise you to know that's maybe a bit of a direction we're going to go in. But Luke 10 introduces us to a character called the Lord of the harvest. And it's really the Lord of the harvest that I want to talk about um, this morning. I guess without thinking too much about it, it's obvious that the Lord of the harvest is the one who is concerned for the harvest. And he's the one who sets the timetable. If you can imagine the sower, the sower gets his big fat diary out and he goes, right, today we're doing the sowing. And then we're going to watch it and we're going to scare the crows away. And we're going to, and then there comes a day when there's, the, the time for the, the cutting, and they have to make sure the weather's right so it's dry. Well, that's what the Lord of the Harvest does. Well, this Lord of the Harvest is interested in the harvest of souls, isn't he? Um, more, than, more than food. And in Matthew 6, it says, Do not worry about what you eat or what you drink. And I want to change our focus this morning away from food 
and really to the Lord of the harvest, who then goes on and says, but seek first my kingdom. Whose kingdom? The Lord of the harvest. And we have to say, Lord, what is your purposes for the harvest in Burgess Hill? What is your purpose for the harvest in the UK? The Lord has a timetable, doesn't he? The Lord of the harvest has a timetable for the harvest in this nation. Well, we're going to go somewhere else, and I want just to introduce you, and you'll know this man. In the book of Ruth, we meet the Lord of the harvest again, or probably for the first time. So if you turn to the book of Ruth, and you will know, um, maybe you will, I, I trust you know, you may not know, the Ruth story. But um, in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 1, we meet Boaz. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a, great, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabites said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one who is, whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So we have Boaz, who is the Lord of the harvest. And he turns up and his concern is for, we'd imagine that Boaz is a rich, wealthy landowner. He has more than one field and he's concerned for his fields, isn't he? He's concerned for the crop. He's a rich man and he says, but look over there, who is this woman who is gleaning? And there's a Ruth, we know that she's turned up in Bethlehem. Naomi and Elimelech, there was a famine in, um, in Bethlehem and they went over to the equivalent to Bexhill. Bexhill is 37 miles away. Well, they went 30 miles to Moab, um, where they said there's food there, and they took their family. And Naomi and Ruth, they knew much death, because there was a famine in the land, and her husband died, and her two sons died. And this old lady called Naomi says, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. Because I hear that in the, in the house of bread, there is food. And Ruth says, I'm going to come with you. And I don't know if you have a, in your head a picture of what Ruth looked like. Um, probably told to us by the Lion Story Bible. But I don't wonder if Ruth wasn't quite as clean cut as we gave her credit for. Because she came from Moab. And the things they did in Moab, we probably can't talk about. The Moabites were the enemies of God. They had stood against Israel when they were walking through the wilderness, and they had nothing to do with the Israelites. In fact, the Moabites were the ones who hired Balaam against the Israelites. The Israelites and the Moabites just did not get on. They didn't. They just weren't friends. Ruth was an enemy of God. And in Moab, the things they did, the, the gods they worshipped, I wouldn't wonder if she turned up with tattoos on her face and earrings in her ears, and an earring in her nose. I wouldn't be surprised at all if she didn't fit in at all. And they looked at her and said, "Who?" and Boaz says, who is that woman over there? She doesn't fit in at all. And the lovely story in the whole of Ruth is that Boaz is referred to as the Redeemer, as my kinsman Redeemer. And the lovely thing is that Ruth, Boaz says to Ruth, you come, enemy of God. And you sit in this house, and we will dip bread in vinegar together. Where else do we see that in Scripture? We see it with Judas and Jesus. Jesus sits with his enemies, and they eat bread together. And I just, I, when I read this a few months ago, and I began to understand, and we have a cafe project on a high street in North Wales, and many Beautiful women turn up with tattoos up their necks and piercings. And I think that is just Ruth. That is just Ruth. She's come a long way. She has known much death. 
And she says, but I'm looking for life. And I want to encourage you, people of Burgess Hill, there's many Ruths out there. There's many Ruths. And they say, like in Psalm 4, they don't, they're Ruths who live underneath roofs. Thank you, Ruby. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, and they're saying, who will show us any good? And there's an encouragement, isn't there, from the Lord that, that he sat with his enemy. In fact, in the end of Psalm 23, it says, I'll make a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And I just wanted to, and I haven't really read that in the same way until last night. I thought maybe the Lord would say to me, you know, sit with your enemies because the Lord has such a heart for them. In fact, in Romans 10, it says we were enemies of God. Before, as the Gentiles, the Lord met us, met me when I was an enemy of God. The things I had done, the places I had been, just means I, didn't, I couldn't have fellowship with God until there was the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, an enemy of God, could sit down with him and he says, let us dip bread together. Well, you know, you probably, well, let me tell you the end of the story. The end of the story is that Ruth, the refugee girl who was looking for life, married the Redeemer. It's interesting that that is also a Revelation theme, isn't it? How Jesus finds his Gentile bride. And harvest and marriage, I know they're at the end of the book, but they are the beginning of something. Have you ever thought about that? We think about the marriage supper of the Lamb as the end of the story. It's not, I got married. It was the beginning of the story. Eight lovely children. You know, a wonderful adventure. It's, you try to tell my wife, this is the end of it, darling. <laughs> Our wedding day. No, it's the beginning, isn't it? And the, the, we're going to look at this right at the end. But the marriage of Ruth and Boaz. The Redeemer marries the enemy. Isn't that wonderful, isn't it? Well, that is the story um, of Ruth. He says, come and dip your bread in the vinegar, just like Judas and Jesus. Um, and it says, he, says to her, he says to her, do not leave hungry. Take this um, to Naomi. And there's another lovely bit in the story of Ruth when you know that, um, and I'm going to, skipping a bit, we're going to come back to it, but Ruth Boaz says, I will marry you, but there is somebody else, he says, who, um, who, needs to, who has a right to you first. And it's a, it's a cousin, isn't it? Or a brother. I think it's a cousin. And he goes to the city gates, and there's an exchange of shoes for the, those who know the story. I don't fully understand that bit. That's for another time. But there's a bit, and Naomi says, Naomi says, don't worry. He won't rest, Ruth, until he has finished it. And in the, in the picture of the Lord Jesus that Boaz is, didn't the Lord say, it is finished? And Boaz went out to redeem the enemy bride, the Gentile bride, and, and Naomi says, he won't stop until it is finished. And the wonderful thing is, Boaz, he understands the law of the, of the land. He can't just marry Ruth. There is a law that has to be fulfilled. And he fulfilled it, didn't he, at that city gate. And Jesus would say to us, there is a law that has to be fulfilled. The law of the Old Testament still has to be fulfilled in every dot and jittle and every dash and dot. It has to be fulfilled to the letter. And Jesus has fulfilled it. That we who once were his enemies may know him and come into that marriage relationship with him. But that's a little bit by the by. Because in the middle of Ruth, there's somewhere I want to stop for a few minutes. And it's in Ruth um, chapter 3 and verse 1 to 11. Now, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman, with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It will be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lives, sorry, lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what you shall do. And she said to her, all that you have said I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. 
When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Um, You know, this is the threshing floor that Ruth met Boaz at. And I wonder if a little bit as we've kind of got older and as we moved on a bit, we've lost sight of really the process of the harvest. And it tells us here a little bit of the process. In the middle of the process of harvest, you have the cutting down of the wheat, and in the middle of it, you have the threshing floor. Now, when I, I, drive, to, um, I drive to Norfolk a fair bit, and I noticed when I was driving a while ago, and if you've ever been to Norfolk, um, it's super flat, isn't it? And there's, there's, there are fruit, grow- fruit growers, and there's wheat fields everywhere. I noticed that there's a field... <clears throat> on my left as you drive past that old garage by the bend, you will know the one, that has this big sign and it says Weetabix. And I just, I'm assuming that that's where they grow the wheat for the Weetabix. I don't doubt it's the only one. But this is Weetabix. And I started thinking, what is the process of making Weetabix? So I Googled it so you don't have to. Well, what you do is you start by getting wheat, it's in the name, and then you harvest it, obviously. And, you, and somehow you thresh it. Now, these days, they thresh, they thresh with a machine, and it's all done on the same field. But in the days of Ruth and Boaz, there was a threshing floor. And it was a large, wide, open space that the wind would blow across. Forgive me if I'm telling you things you already know. And they would use animals and these things called threshing sledges, and they would take the harvest, um, and they would lay it out. There weren't engines in those days. Correct, Ruby, thank you. The engines was the horse and the mule. And they would trample all over this this harvest. And then they would come with a winnowing fork and they would chuck it in the air and the wind would take away the chaff. That is the threshing process. And if you Google it, something else, on YouTube, which I did, generally the process today is the same. They separate it and they blow all over it and it blows away the chaff and we're left with the wheat of Weetabix. They then take the wheat of the Weetabix, and they take it to the Weetabix factory. It's going to be owned by Kraft now, isn't it, probably? No, which is why I'm taking this parable to the modern day, Ruby, okay? Keep us on our toes, lovely. They did. They didn't have Weetabix then, which is why that generation died out, and which is why why we are so strong, and this full of churches full of healthy older people, because we have Weetabix in our lives. Um... And they, they take it to the Weedabix factory, and they mix it with, you won't be t- um, fibroflavin, whatever it's called, and some barley malt extract and some salt, and they cook it, and then they put it through a milling machine, and they turn the wheat into flakes, and then they squash it, and they put it in a box. That is the process. Now, we, Weedabix don't grow on trees, unless you had wondered. There is a process that goes towards making all these products, all these products, There is a process. The harvest has a process. And if you were to open your box of Weetabix one morning, hoping to be, to add years to your life, and instead of Weetabix, out came, out came straw, you would say, wait a second, somebody hasn't done their job properly. Somebody has missed out a part of this process. You would say, I can't eat that. I wish somebody had threshed it better. I just pinched this corn from my son's chicken house. He doesn't know. I'll put it back, every single bit of it. Um, there's a, somebody has dodged a process, do you understand? And you can't dodge the threshing process when it comes to the things of the harvest. We have to go through the process of the harvest. That's what the Lord of the harvest requires of us. He would say to us this morning, there is a process, you know, that you have to go through with the harvest. 
and you can't dodge the threshing or you won't get the Weetabix. And I think often as a church, and I point to myself, I think it's very easy to, um, to think that we can somehow take shortcuts in the processes of God. Threshing is incredibly important. And the Lord, I believe, wants a threshing floor in your life. And if you want to follow the Lord or go on with the Lord or bring new people to the Lord, they've got to go through the threshing floor. Ruth had to go to the threshing floor if she was going to meet the Lord of the harvest. That is where we meet the Lord. That is where the Lord says, this is the place where things are separated, that you may be useful for me. The threshing floor is the place of separation. And if you were to turn to 2 Samuel, I'm going to just tell you two other times where this threshing floor is spoken about. 2 Samuel um, 24 and verse 15. This is the time when David counted the people. And I don't know why God was, but God was angry with David for counting the people. And he says, I'm going to send a judgment upon you, David. And David had to choose between pestilence or death or famine or plague. You remember this? And there came a time, it says in, in um, chapter, verse 15, So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and 70,000 men of David's people from Dan to Bathsheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who, the, who was destroying the people, It is enough. Now relax your hand, and the angel of the Lord was threshing, was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusites. This is a threshing floor um, in the story of David. And the story then goes on and says, David then bought Aruna's threshing floor, and this was where he reserved that space for Solomon to build the temple. Solomon built his temple on the threshing floor of Aruna. And you may or may not know, this is where Solomon says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. This is where he said it from. And he says, will my people, and he's speaking to me, he's speaking to us. And he says, if the God's people as a nation, God's people, it says judgment begins at the house of God. And there's an encouragement this morning Will we allow the Lord to separate us? Will we be a separate people? Will we be a people who are threshed? And here is the amazing thing. The church needs to be a threshing floor. The church of God needs to be a threshing floor. The church of God in this nation needs to be a place where the wheat and the chaff are separated. When people, when Ruth comes through this door, she is met with such love and such generosity, even as an enemy of God, and she will not look like what the Lion Story Bible said she would, but she's looking for life. And she says, I've walked a long way, I've known nothing but death. Is this where I find life? You're doing her no favors if you said, come, my lovely, but we're not going to bother with the threshing floor, because then there's no relationship with the Lord of the harvest. Church has to be a place where the holy and the polluted are separated. And you are probably looking on in this nation, and you're probably saying, but in so many cases, it's not. In so many cases, the church in this nation is not a threshing floor. The church in this nation says, we're so desperate to get Ruth in. We're so desperate to, to save the sinner that we won't tell them they need to be separate. And the Bible calls this holiness. Jesus says, be ye holy, because I am holy. You know, the Lord is calling us to holiness. In this nation, as a church, if there's going to be any hope of saving people that they may know Boaz that they may know the Lord of the harvest, we've got to choose holiness. There's nothing 
special, sorry, nothing pleasant about being threshed. I, we turned up at a new church recently because we moved house um, from North Wales to 30, 30 miles away um, near Petersfield. And we went to a new church and a lovely, godly people. But for the first month, it was very uncomfortable because I thought these people are not going to accept the flesh or the things in my life because they are a very godly bunch. And I was really challenged but there was a part of it that involved me being trampled underfoot by men and being sifted as the Holy Spirit blew away the chaff. Even the Lord just used that new experience, that new situation to say, Graham, there are things in your life that need to be separate. The, ch the true church of God in this nation has to be a threshing floor. It has to be a place where the holy and the polluted are kept separate. But that does not mean that Ruth is not welcome. That means we have to be bold and say there has to be holiness here. There has to, in this church, in this nation, there has to be um, a holiness. Um, if we turn to Luke 3, it's mentioned again in a slightly different way. Luke chapter 3, verse 17 it talks about, well, John is speaking, he talks about Jesus and he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. And I read this a, a, about a year ago and I thought, wait a second, what's the gospel doing here? Because the gospel is like seven pages this way. Why is there a gospel in the middle of what John is saying? Why, how dare he talk about the gospel? It hasn't happened. Well, gospel just means good news. And the Jesus, John is saying, Jesus is coming. He will come among us. And he has in his hand a winnowing fork. But it's good news. It's good news that the Lord Jesus would require of us to be separate. Because otherwise, if we're not separate as God's people now there will be a great separation in the book of Revelation. And that is thoroughly bad news. That if we haven't dealt with uh, the separation between the holy and the profane, it's utterly bad news, isn't it? So the Lord says to us, to me, to the church in this nation, let me do it for you now. Be willing to be separate. Be willing to be somebody um, who is who is able and willing to go through the threshing floor, that the Lord of the harvest might meet with you or might be able to use you. Um, and I guess one of the questions is, well, how then, Lord, would you do this? Well, I want to encourage you. Actually, it just begins by taking the word of God seriously because the Bible says in Hebrews that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and it's able to separate bone from marrow, and thoughts from intention, and I think it says soul from spirit. He is able to do it. Far better he does it than some blunt instrument like me. Far better he does it than some religion. Far better he does it than some discussion group. The word of God will challenge you about separation in your life. And if we just finish with Luke 10, where we started... The Lord says, the harvest is plentiful. Psalm 4 says, many are saying, who will show us any good? Ruth is saying, where can I go? I am hungry and lost, and all I know is death. And the Lord would say, the harvest is plentiful. But then it says, but the laborers are few. And do you know what? Here's the challenge to us. The challenge is, it's not that God is short of volunteers. I'm sure Bible colleges and churches are full of people who say, Lord, I'm willing to go. Actually, I think it's that the Lord is short of people who understand the harvest. Who say, I understand what it means to go through the process. And I've gone through threshing myself. And I understand how important this is. Otherwise, you're doing a work from the Lord. And then the Weetabix factory phone up and says, you know that, that grain you sent? 
it's all full of bits and I can't use it. And I think the Lord would just challenge us. If we want to be involved in his harvest and the harvest is plentiful, we have to, as God's people, go again and again and again to the threshing floor. And we have to say, I want to be holy as you are holy because I've met Ruth and I want to lead her to the threshing floor. And I know we are, we are scared, aren't we, of what that will mean. But there's no future for the people in our towns and villages. There's no relationship with the Lord of the harvest unless they too will choose to set things aside and be holy. But it's utterly good news because in the genealogy of Luke, we meet Ruth again. That funny looking Moabite girl that started picking up bits of fields in the Lord of the Harvest, who was willing to go to the threshing floor. She's right in the middle of the genealogy in the book of Luke, and it says, Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the son of, sorry, the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David the king. And then it goes further down, it says, Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Ruth, that awkward girl from Moab, who was an enemy of God, because she was willing to go to the threshing floor and meet with Boaz, she's right smack bang in the middle of the bringing the Lord Jesus onto earth. And she's right smack bang in the middle of the genealogical line of David the king. Who would have thought it? We had no hope for that girl. But she was willing to go to the threshing floor. And now we have Jesus. And I want to encourage you that if you want to be part of bringing the Lord Jesus into your situation, we've just got to make a choice. In the world that has knocked down its walls and pushed away its barriers and says, nothing really is holy anymore. Everything is fair game. We can mix the holy and the polluted. God's people and I include myself, the challenge is, will we go to the threshing floor again? Amen. Dear Lord, these are not easy things. And Lord, there are no rules other than that we come to your word daily and that we know something of that surgical blade that is able to rightly and delicately and surgically divide in our life. The things that we know according to your word need to be separate. And Lord, would we find in our nation those that are able to be separate and have a heart for the harvest that you might find, find laborers who are willing to carry your burdens and to work underneath the Lord of the harvest. Amen.